If you ask an Oddworld fan their favorite Oddworld game, they'll probably say Abe's Odyssey or Abe's Exodus. Well, mine is Munch's Odyssey. Even after finishing every Oddworld game except for Soulstorm, which I'm not even close to finishing, and the Game Boy games, Munch's Odyssey still is my favorite. This is probably because it's one of the first games I've ever played in my parents' modded Xbox, along with Sonic Heroes when I was around 4 years old. But since Munch's Odyssey wasn't as big of a success as the first two games, the game is quite obscure and there isn't much documentation of the developing process of the game. Well, today I will show you all kinds of stuff from the developing process. Betas, unused content, trivia and more. A lot of the stuff covered is already documented in the Oddworld wiki, so this video is more for those of you who are too lazy to read an internet page, although I'll show you some more unique stuff that isn't on the wiki. Note that I won't ever talk about the GBA version of the game. You should check out Cybershell's bonus videos on Sonic 1, 2, 3 and Sonic CD, as that's where I got the video and title idea. First of all, note that most of the cut content in the game is found on the original PC port of the game and on the Xbox version. As many of you already know, a severely different version of Munch's Odyssey was originally going to be released for the PlayStation 2, but complicated development cycles on the system forced Oddworld inhabitants to scrap this version and rebuild the game on the Xbox. Additional deadlines set by Microsoft saw much of the plot streamlined from its original incarnation and the gameplay simplified. The original version would have used an entirely different engine which would have put a focus on environmental changes. There are a lot of assets in the game that were scrapped. Three vendors were scrapped from the game during development and one of them is actually still present in the game files and demos. This one is the climb vendor which would have been used to climb walls that Abe normally couldn't. One of the two vendors scrapped early in development was the Lung Buster Cigarettes vendor. According to the wiki, the vendor would have been just a novelty machine and it was most likely just used to promote Munch's Odyssey. The final scrapped vendor was the Shields vendor. These vending machines would have been used by the Big Bro Sligs as a form of heavy riot gear in the case of a mass Madokan uprising. As a defensive vendor, the Shields vendor would have provided the Big Bros a tremendous boost in forwards defense, possibly making the Big Bro immune to all small firearms. There is a weapon that was also scrapped and is also present in the game files, this one being the Shock Rocker Club. This weapon was featured in the game's manual, but it is never used in game, but can be seen along with the climb vendor in something I will show you further in the video. This weapon would have been used by the interns, as shown by this image. There was going to be this weird ass munch alter ego in the game. It's similar to the Shrikul and apparently it would have been triggered by munch getting mad at Abe for repeatedly slapping him. There was also going to be this weird giant mosquito called the Skeeter. It inhabits the jungles of Muros and flies around and attaches their stinger to a victim's head to drain their blood. I have absolutely no idea how this could have been used. The middle is a large arthropod native to Muros. They were meant to have a more prominent role in the game due to how their young population was experimented on and how they were frequently genetically modified to create mugs. Enough with vendors and weapons and weird ass monsters, there are also plenty of unused audio files in the game. In these files there are three unused ape audios, one where he says GROW which was going to be used whilst he was growing spoose. The other one is he screaming for help, help and the other one is he saying Oh damn these last two audios are known in the game files as ape underscore chase one and ape underscore chase 3 so these were probably going to be used when ape was being chased by slicks or slugs or paramites. 
According to the wiki, there is one unused Munch Victory quote audio which I can find anywhere in the game files, nor on the internet. There are seven unused audios of Mudokans reacting to insults used by possessed enemies. I know I'm a loser! <laughs> Pick on somebody with your own ugliness! No, no, I'm depressed! Please don't, I'm depressed! Bounces off of me and sticks to you! If I had a real job, I wouldn't put up with this! Why don't you just piss off? Please, not now! I'm busy scrubbing! A supposedly unknown character known as the Candy Striper in the game files has this unused audio of it saying Insanitive Time, according to the wiki. Insanitive Time! Since the file is called Candy Striper underscore GS underscore Sedative, I assume it actually says it's Sedative Time and not Insanitive Time. There are also scripts for the AI of the Candy Striper, and there are textures and a model for it in the game. The only things I could find about it on the internet is this thing on the Oddworld library which just says snoozer redirect from Candy Striper, and this tutorial on Game Banana which shows you how to swap characters in the game, and it shows the snoozer as type equals Candy Striper, so it just shows that the Candy Striper is probably just an early name for the snoozer. There is this weird ass chant audio file called Chant01. Yo, yo, yo. I have no idea if this is ever used in the final game, but for someone who has over 270 hours on the game on Steam, I don't remember ever hearing this audio. There is an unused audio of a Glucken saying he deserves a promotion. I deserve a promotion. There is an unused gong audio in the game files which would probably be used when Abe and Munch ended up dying. And finally, there is this weird audio called Jesse by a dude called Jesse J at Microsoft asking you to send your log file to him. Hi, if you're hearing this, please send your log file to Jesse J, that's J E S S E J at Microsoft.com right now. Thanks. I couldn't find any information about this being in another game or anything regarding Jesse J. Now we're going to analyze the demos, the trailers and the PS2 tech demo. We'll cover the Xbox E3 2000 gameplay footage, the Passport to Oddworld E3 2001 trailer and the famous PS2 tech demo. The analysis of the E3 2000 gameplay footage and 2001 trailer are made by the Oddworld Wiki. First of all, let's start by the Xbox E3 2000 gameplay footage. I'm not going to show you the entire video, it will be in the description if you want to watch it by yourself, but basically, Brewery to be, Nomad's Land and Splinter's Manufacturing had different maps. There were no landmines on the bridge of Nomad's Land. A fly mode would have been featured in the game. The climb window can be seen during the fly mode montage. There was a tutorial beta stage in Brewery to be instead of Raisin's Cave. When Abe gets in the travel well and lands on top of a hill, he makes a grunt sound that's actually from Abe's Odyssey and Abe's Exodus. The spoose lock looks different. The rescue portal looks different and makes a different sound effect. and there is an Xbox controller board in Splinter's manufacturing. That's everything for the E3 2000 footage, now let's go to the Passport to Oddworld E3 2001 trailer. The water mines look different. The Iban Munch teleporter looks different. Levers don't have a green slash red light.
some Mudokans were bald, and the climb machine can be seen during the montage of the Beta Nomad's land level. And that's everything for this trailer as well, so now let's head to the famous PS2 tech demo. First of all, I wanna make clear that everything in this tech demo is pre-rendered. Not a single bit of footage is actual gameplay of what was supposedly a PS2 version of the game. Also, most of the settings that the trailer takes place in don't resemble any level in the final game. So basically, Mudokans could be seen carrying wood logs and spears. The environmental changes can be seen in this clip where you can see that the setting is getting hotter and the river is drying up and the trees are dying. There are these weird ass flying creatures that are never seen in the final game, that which I don't even know if they were ever featured in any other world game. You can see Murakan running on a hamster wheel, which is never seen in the final game, and is actually used in the Soulstorm trailer, even though it might not be a reference to this. You can see a slag sounding an alarm which never happens in the final game, but the audio is present in the Xbox game files. Here you can see a different version of Splinter's manufacturing. It appears that it has more machinery and detail to it than the final version, probably because all of the tech demo is pre-rendered and the developers couldn't have that level of detail and make the game run well. You can see this slick smoking. The recycling fan is hugely different and it even shows the amount of meat, fat, bone, scrap and fluids that the slick has. At the end it even shows the percentage of the slick's components that are deemed as usable and non-usable. In this clip you can see Ape throwing a slick out of the window, which isn't possible in the final game. Also, when the slick hits the ground, it leaves a decal on the floor, representing his blood and insides. Here you can see Murokans traveling the desert, which doesn't resemble anything seen in the final game, as there isn't any desert level in the game. There is also this weird location where there are dozens of slicks marching and you can see a hamburger on the wall. You can see this particular footage in the trailer of the game. You can see Mudokans running through the jungle and dancing, which again doesn't resemble anything in the final game. You can see this weird ass clip of Ape getting shot by Soulstorm cans, eventually falling on the ground but having one can hitting his back and landing in his mouth, being forced to drink it and he either gets sick or fucking dies, but I'm not sure. Here you can see these different looking Mudokans with helmets are dressed up like construction workers. The setting in which this clip takes place is supposed to be the outside of the Splinter's manufacturing. Mudokans had this weird ability where they could grow trees when chanting and I'm not sure what this could have been useful for. Maybe it had something to do with the environmental changes, but I don't know. Construction Mudokans could also take down the trees with saws. Here you can take a better look of an early Splinter's manufacturing. And now, this is very interesting. You can see Madokans chanting to power this type of structure that looks like the actual storm circle present in the Madokan fortress and the dead river levels. The thing is that the storm circle looks significantly different from the ones used in the final game and they had Madokans play this weird pink X before chanting.
Enough with analysis, let's go to the trivia. In the Oddworld forum, there's a rather obscure thread where you can actually download the debug mode of the game made by MLG Man, letting you access beta and testing stages as well as stages from the final game. For it to work, you have to download the levelselect.xml file in the thread and go to the games folder, then to the menus folder and then to the start folder, and then you place it there. It will ask you to replace the file, but I recommend you backing up your game files beforehand. Launching the game, you'll see that the menu is completely different, and it has a debug menu option on the top. Clicking on it will prompt you to the level select screen, and you can also select other, test levels and the real front end UI. Going to the test levels and clicking on the death reset level will just teleport you to a white void where you can do anything. Clicking on the one with everything level will just crash your game. Clicking on the char room you can actually see stuff. As the name says, this room is for character testing, which means here you can see all the characters that are in the game. You can possess them, slap them, grab them, but they won't attack you. One cool thing here is that you can actually see an intern using the Shock Rocker Club. As I've shown you already, it has no texture and is just a pink model, but it's very cool to see nonetheless. That's about the only interesting thing here, so let's go to the window test level. Here you can see all of the vendors in the game, including a fully working, fully textured and modeled climb window, even though the texture for it is significantly lower quality than the other vendors. As I said, it is used for Abe to climb walls that he normally couldn't, so it's cool to see that this vendor is still present and fully works in the game files. Unfortunately, there aren't any other scrapped vendors in this level, like the Long Buster Cigarettes vendor or the Shields vendor. That's about it here, let's go to the Even test. And it's just a black void, you can do anything here. Going to Mark test, you actually get teleported to a different version of Raisin's Cave. There isn't any spoos, you spawn outside of the gate where you normally spawn, there is this weird white fog in the distance, and you can see a mood archer on the ground and two slicks on a platform. None of these three do anything, you can call the mood archer, you can tell him to attack the slicks, nothing. The slicks will do nothing too. Also, the spoos lock is absolutely fucked, there is no model or texture, just the display saying 50. There are no more test levels left, so let's go to the real front end UI. And this just the game intro. Going to the other section, you can actually see two options, Sobe Demo and Euro Demo. None of these work even in the original beta of the Steam release. Well, in the original North American release of Manchester Odyssey, the health vendor is replaced by a Sobe vending machine, which is a real-world beverage. During the run-up to Munch's Odyssey's release, Sobe aided promoting by giving away a number of Oddworld decorated goods, including waterbeds and a jet ski. Oddworld inhabitants returned the favor by replacing a number of health up vendors with Sobe dispensers. This was not a business deal and no money was ever exchanged. In the PAL version of Munch's Odyssey, a normal health up vendor is used instead. And finally, we have Euro Demo. There is also no documentation of this name in specific, but there is a demo version of the game found on the official Xbox magazine that was published online by the user Askabit. I tried for a long time to get this working on my PC, since I have no idea where my modded Xbox is, so I'll just have to show you this video by Lostraniero91. There isn't much to see here, just a tutorial level showing you the game, with some differences that we already covered. The only interesting thing here is the climb vendor, which I already showed you. In the PC version of the game, there are audio clips that have a noticeable worse quality than the others. Oh yeah, everybody listen! 
Actually, the original PC port of the game was absolutely fucked. The wiki says that the port had problems with the OpenGL graphic drivers, legacy codes and old assets caused the game to be on Steam in a near unplayable state ever since the Oddbox's release. I can't find any footage of this happening, even in the original beta version of the Steam release. The only thing I could find were this weird texture, object and shadow popping. You can see this pushrubs rendering and when ape jumps or when you throw a madokan, their shadow will follow them up as well. And you couldn't change from sneaking, walking and running like you can in the HD release. Other thing that happens is that some sound effects are absolutely deafening for some reason. Overall textures and models are in lower quality on the HD port since most of the assets were taken from the Xbox game. Also, if you are using a controller and alt tab while in game, in some occasions when you go back to the game the controller won't work anymore, only working again if you restart the game. Also, the sonar had this deafening, high-pitched sound at the end, for some reason. I could go on and show you all the differences between the Xbox and the HD version of the game, but it isn't that interesting, really. And I only played the first two levels to try to find those problems the wiki was talking about. These problems are probably only found on an even older PC port of the game, or only happen in older hardware, as I didn't have any issue with the original PC port. The Invisible and Aqua Bounce are the only vending machines in Munch's Odyssey to not have native variations, the latter of which is never seen in any of the outer levels. The surgical procedure Munch underwent at the Vikers Labs was similar to the real-life experiment involving Breaches, a baby monkey who had a transmitter strapped to his head. It is also worth mentioning Breaches had his eyes soon shut, which may have been a possible inspiration for the blind Madokans. Several story threads were also cut from the final version of the game due to time constraints. One of these involved Abe's biological mother, Sam, who was mentioned at the conclusion of Abe's exodus. Another concerned Moloch's trial against Lady Margaret. As many of you know, this game has a neutral or good ending and a bad ending. But some of you may not know that the game also has an angelic and black ending. To unlock the angelic ending, the player must maintain an angelic warmer throughout the game by rescuing nearly all of the scrubs and fuzzles and retrieving all of the labor eggs. In addition to the same cutscene shown in the neutral ending, a bonus Daily Deception newspaper is shown before the credits. This addition states that due to the massive breakout of scrubs and missing fuzzles, the economy has been ruined and stock prices are exponentially falling. It also reveals that the Glucken Queen, Lady Margaret, has been placed on life support, and Lulu is held to blame for the Vikers Labs disaster. Abe and Munch, along with the Mudokans and Fuzzles he rescued, are branded as fugitives and are reportedly still at large. The game ends by showing a final epilogue congratulating the player for their heroic deeds. To unlock the black ending, the player must maintain a black warmer throughout the game by killing all of the scrubs and fuzzles and destroying all of the labor eggs. Once the bad ending is shown, a bonus daily deception newspaper is shown to contrast with the angelic ending. The newspaper refers to the player as an evil bastard and states further that with all of the renegade fugitives captured, the industrial society is safeguarded. Lady Margaret also successfully receives the lung transplant, and the last can of Gabiar is revealed to have been eaten by the winner of the auction, effectively rendering the Gabit species as extinct. Finally, a new Mudokan labor force is shown to be in its infancy after hatching from a new batch of labor eggs. Throughout the game, depending on your Quarma rating, a few different newspaper clippings will be shown to reflect your actions. In Brewery to Be, if you rescue the Mudokans, it will show a newspaper saying Employee Recruitment Area Empty, Scrubs Disappear. But if the Mudokans die or are not rescued, it will show a newspaper saying Mudokan Scrubs Killed in Scrab Rampage. 
I actually have no idea how many Modokans you have to rescue for it to trigger which newspaper. The same happens in the Magog motors. If you rescue the Modokans, the newspaper will say Security fails, Modokan scrubs escape. But if you don't rescue them, it will say Scrubs transfer to higher security facility. In Meep Herder village, the shaman actually breaks the fourth wall, saying The Modok and Meep Herders are so distressed that they can't even hurt their own Meep. Gain their confidence by hurting the Meep back into their place. You might want to try munching his wheelchair for this one. There are actually numerous occasions where the game breaks the fourth wall. For example, when the Almighty Raisin speaks of Lulu's name during his part of the cutscene, Lulu suddenly wakes up confused. Pitiful excuse for a glucken. He is called Lulu. Huh? The first two rescued Madokans in the return to Vikers Labs talk about their job placing eggs back. They say to the camera, oh, We wait here and gather up all the egg crates that even mice are gonna throw into the loading chute. Right? That's my understanding. I hope they don't break them all. Knowing what the player will do. The possession orb used for Ape's possession ability was added as a solution to handle the ability in a 3D environment. An earlier idea was to have Ape automatically target the closest possessable character the player could see, similar to the earlier Oddworld games, but this was later scrapped. The end credits show this photo of the developers dressed as doctors next to Munch and some fuzzles looking at the camera above. You can also see Lorne Lanning looking like a cartoon villain and Sherry McKenna dressed in white. Microsoft intended to change the title of the game to Ape and Munch's Fun Adventures so that it might appeal to more casual gamers. Munch's Odyssey was one of the Xbox launching titles, but it was ultimately overshadowed by Halo 1. Apparently, the Munch's Odyssey demo I covered was also present in the Halo 1 disc. And that's about everything for the video. I'll see you on the next video, maybe with a Soulstorm bonus video if there's any cool stuff to cover, or Sonic Heroes bonus video or something.